I'm Dan Brand. I'm president of the Historical Society. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to our program tonight, and thanks for coming. And uh, with that, uh, we'll introduce Harlan here. He was a teacher at West Marshall for a lot of years, and now we call him his honor. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, and that's one of the better names. Uh, as, <laughs> There's always a hazard in being a politician a little bit, even at the local level. So you can get a, you can develop a lot of names and so on. And, but anyway, uh, uh, the basis of the program is the fact this is the sesquicentennial year for state senators, 150 years. And as part of that, uh, I wrote a history of state center for those 150 years. And basically, I'm going to try and give you a synopsis of that here tonight. Uh, thank my wife, Marsha, who did the editing for that. Uh, grammar at times was always a challenge for me, especially in a written form. Uh, I always liked, I don't know is it true or not, but Andrew Jackson had a quote, uh, it's a damn fool that can only think of one way to spell a word. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> So uh, anyway, the, the spelling in the uh, history is uh, pretty decent, I think, and uh, I thank Marsha for that. Uh, this is it. It's available. You know, I'll sell that later to you. I have a few copies I brought here. They're, they're $10. You know, this is the commercial part, I guess, at this point. So that uh, to go with it. And then to uh, kind of kick it off, I'm going to, I did bring one prop. Uh, and it is a soil map of Marshall County. Uh, and if later on when you look at it, one of the things that I think is best part of start, it shows the railroads that, that were here. I'm doing good. Uh, it shows the railroads and the, I'll do it this way. Yeah, I'll just hold it. Anyway, the, the settlement of Marshall County, the settlement of Iowa is pretty much tied to the soils. I think, you, you know, the, what brought settlers here, what brought people here was the soil itself. And on this map, you also see that the railroads that were put in, this is pre-highways for the most part, uh, that were put in, followed the lay of the land because they wanted to get the least grade possible. It was the most efficient way for the railroads to operate. So, uh, soil map, this is the basic reason Iowa's here, particularly the small towns. Uh, they served the farmers that came in. So uh, a lot of the ancest our ancestors came in as farmers, or then they evolved to uh, moving to those small towns and so on and servicing the farm communities. But that, this will be available for you to look at later. Obviously, it's uh, too much detail for the uh, state center is right there on the uh, western edge of Marshall County. Marshall Towns here, of course. Uh, Chicago Northwestern Line runs across here. Uh, the Milwaukee down here. Uh, there's a branch line of the uh, Emmon St. L that ran up in here through uh, the northern part of the county. Plus, going up here, you have the, also the Emmon St. L railroads running. But, uh, you know, that's, that's what serviced the county and uh, was the basis for the communities prior to the. Uh, rival of, uh, or the development of highways. And I'll talk about that somewhat later. Now I'll try and be less clumsy and uh, get to the history a little bit. Uh, Marshall County was established in 1848. First settlers in the area of southwestern Marshall County, which would be the area of State Center and Rhodes, first settler was Green Allen in 1849. He made a claim on 600 acres, built a cabin. Second settler arrived in 1850, a third in 1852. Uh, eight more settlers and their families arrived in 1854. Notably among them was C.B. Rhodes and H. Robb. Mr. Robb was the first to file a claim on land in what became a State Center Township. Originally, the State Center area was a part of Eden Township which was established in 1855. Conway Rhodes uh, laid out the town of Edenville in 1857. A post office was set up that year uh, with weekly mail service to Marietta. Uh, Marietta was at that time the designated county seat. 
C.B. Rhodes later became a leading businessman and developer of State Center as well. The 1850s saw the development of a significant German settlement called French Grove in the area north of State Center. Some of its earliest settlers were from the Alsace region of France, uh, which was German-speaking. Anselm, Wants, Fonts, and Eckhart were some of the family names from these earliest settlers to the French Grove area. John Anselm was one of the first two residents of State Center. The reason the early settlements were in Eden Township and French Grove was the availability of timber for building materials and for fuel. Uh, the advantage was short-lived as the coming of the railroad provided building materials, fuel, and other supplies to the, town, uh, to the towns uh, that it served. In addition, the railroad provided a market for farmers' products. State Center was created to serve as a trading center for the first railroad built across Iowa. Uh, in 1861, the Cedar Rapids and Missouri Railroad surveyed a route across Marshall County. Uh, this determined the location of the community that would become State Center. In 1863, the rail line that operated the Chicago Northwestern Railroad, today it's the uh, Union Pacific, they acquired it approximately uh, 1994, about 20, a little over 20 years ago, uh, was completed to that location. Uh, in 1864, the railroad bought 80 acres and platted a town, which was called Center Station. The first station agent was William Barnes, uh, who instructed a shed and began buying wheat from local farmers. He is credited with changing the name of the town to State Center uh, due to its location near the center of the state. The post office was established in 1864 and was located in the depot. William Barnes and John Ansom were identified as the first two residents of State Center. John Ansom moved a 18 by 20 foot building from Marietta to State Center. Uh, used it as a hotel. William Barnes built the first house, which was also a hotel, called the Union House. Uh, this was part of the, his agreement with the railroad. 1865 saw the rapid expansion of State Center's business offerings. Uh, J.W. Dobbin and V.J. Shipman arrived in January and opened a store offering groceries, boots, and shoes. Uh, they were from New York. Uh, Shipman was a uh, Civil War veteran, had been a captain, I think re uh, retired as a, a colonel from the Union armies. Uh, his, uh, they were, we believe, or I'm pretty sure he is neighbors with uh, J.W. Dobbin, uh, who had been operating a store in, in Illinois. So they came together then. You're, again, you're right after the Civil War. Uh, a few years later, we'll get into the fact that uh, J.W. Dobbin's younger brother, Alex, also a Civil War veteran, uh, would come to State Center to farm. Uh, Mr. Dobbin recounted that there were only six buildings in State Center when he arrived in 1865. The first doctor in State Center was Dr. O.G. Hunt, uh, who came in 1866. He was also a Civil War veteran. And in fact, the, the Grand Army of the Republic chapter, the GAR, was named after him. Uh, so, uh, one of the early prominent citizens. In 1867, C.B. Rhodes built the first brick building in town. Uh, the total population was now estimated at around 600. Uh, so State Center was almost an instant town. When the railroad reached there, uh, the settlers poured in, the farmland was uh, sold off in large numbers uh, as the, you know, all of that good soil then became available to use. And then, of course, with the railroad, you had a market for the products. Uh, I didn't put it in here, but uh, about, about the in 1865, I believe, also, or 1864, they talked about the fact they drove about a herd of 1,200 hogs to town, and they had a snowstorm, and they all froze standing up. Because, uh, you know, uh, you had to get to the railroad, and if a farmer was any distance from the railroad, the only way you're really going to get uh, your crop there was to probably have it walk. 
So that you'd drive the hogs or you'd drive the cattle to get them there so you could have something to market. Uh, due to the railroad's connection to the growing and expanding nation and the fertile farmland surrounding it, State Center grew rapidly uh, into a thriving and prosperous community. The rapid population growth of State Center was similar to that of Marshall County in the state of Iowa. Uh, in 1850, the state of Iowa had a population of 192,000 plus people. By 1870, it was 1,194,000. Uh, added a million people in 20 years. Marshall County in 1850 had 338 people. In 1870, it was 17,506. Uh, State Center in 1850 was zero, it didn't exist. Uh, in the census of 1870, uh, 559 people. Uh, in other words, if you like, take a look at Iowa now, that's more than an awful lot of towns in Iowa. And it was, like I say, almost an instant town. Uh, State, Center petition for incorpor uh, State Center's petition for incorporation was granted in August 26, 1867. Uh, this recognized the mayor and city council who were empowered to organize the government and to establish the or ordinances that would govern the city. Committees were formed and ordinances uh, uh, were set up and plans for the election of officers and for maintaining order uh, were passed. Uh, rules governing sidewalks, streets, disposal of garbage, livestock were established. In March 1st, 1869, the first municipal election for the uh, corporation was held. Uh, one early ordinance required that all able-bodied men assist in fighting fires under the direction of the mayor and other city officials. So I don't think I have that power today, which is probably very fortunate for State Center. Uh, expanding city services then, uh, not surprisingly, uh, one of the first, uh, the volunteer fire department is one of the first organizations established in 1875. An ordinance creating uh, the State Center Volunteer Fire Department was passed. An engine, 800 feet of hose were purchased, and about 45 volunteers were recruited. Uh, in the history book, there's a nice picture of that group, uh, of which uh, several of the members, I think you can actually identify. If, if you get it online, you can expand the pictures enough that you can actually see. So if anybody's interested, I can show you uh, one of the early... Uh, <laughs> Uh, businessman of significance was Sam Brimhall, who had his distinctive way of looking off to his left whenever he's having his picture taken, and he had a relatively full goatee type beard. So you can pretty well pick him out. And it, but anyway, you, you can identify him pretty clearly as one of those uh, 1875 volunteer firemen. Uh, the State Center Fire Department's members uh, have continued their long tradition of uh, outstanding community service. They have shown their expertise by winning numerous state championships in the uh, State Volunteer Fire Department conventions. Uh, state Center finished first in every state fire convention held between 1938 and 1948. Now, they did have advantage of the fact that World War II kept that from being held a couple, some of those years. But anyway, they did have a solid. They were the only ones that won for that time span. Uh, today, the volunteer, volunteer Fire Department provides not only essential services to our community, but also provide a source of civic pride. Uh, membership in the department is, for some families, a tradition. Uh, Jim Eckhart has been fire chief since 1995. Uh, his father, Ed, served as fire chief for 18 years, uh, and his grandfather, Walter Eckhart, served as fire chief for 34 years. So uh, the, you know, the last hundred years is almost has uh, been pretty well dominated by them as being fire chiefs. There have been some others in between, but for the most part, fairly long service. Uh, now, going with the fire department, probably about the second thing you need is it's hard to be an effective fire department without water. So, the water utility was established in 1877. 
Uh, the effectiveness of the fire department somewhat depended upon this. It included a well, a thousand feet of water mains, a water tower, and sick hydrants, and a pump. Uh, in 1925, problems with water supply and water quality led the city to again look to improve the water system. That year, voters approved a bond issue to extend the water system and to drill a new well north of town. A new water tower was constructed in 1929. Uh, in the paper, it pointed out that the citizens, some were not real happy because the council did that without put, passing a bond issue. Uh, I think they'd voted it down a couple of times, so they managed to uh, do this out of reserves. The local editor was not uh, happy. I took it from the, the nature of the paper. Uh, increasing water pressure and improvement of the water uh, reserves for fire protection. Okay, this is reason for the tower. Uh, Poor water quality led to the addition of an iron, iron removal plant in 1935. Uh, water shortages... Uh, were the cause of the decision to drill a new deep well in 1957, which somehow to me today does not seem as long ago as it would have at one time. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Uh, that would, this would meet the city's needs. That well has uh, been relined twice, including last year, and is still in use today. Uh, we, side side, we relined it with stainless steel. Uh, the life of a steel pipe was about supposed to be 20 to about 30 years, somewhere in there. Stainless steel, they haven't been doing it long enough. They couldn't tell us for sure how much longer it would last, but we're betting that it hopefully will give us 40 or 50 years of service. Um, in 19, uh, pardon me, in 2016, the well was relined and repaired and was made, uh, 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 repairs were made to the water treatment system. Plans for a new reverse osmosis, reverse osmosis treatment plant were put on hold because of cost. Uh, and with city government and everything else, it, uh, money sometimes becomes an issue. Anyway, uh, water quality remains a major goal of the city. And again, as you know, in Marshalltown, State Center, and most a lot of places around it, it we're continuing to deal with that some of these issues and problems. Uh, continuing here, I don't want to get too much on the asides. Keep track. Yeah. Uh, the next major expansion of city services came in 1899 when the citizens approved an appropriation of $5,000 for the construction of a municipal electric plant. Uh, two earlier efforts to franchise a private company had been voted down by the citizens. Uh, State Center has pretty much a long tradition of wanting to be independent, and uh, this would be one of the earlier examples of that. Uh, at first, service was only from sundown to midnight. Uh, in 1909, service included one forenoon uh, a week for ironing. Uh, in 1913, service was extended to rural lines. And in 1916, 24-hour uh, service was provided for the first time, which probably makes refrigeration a lot more practical at that point. Uh, steam engines were used to generate electricity until 1927 and 1928 when diesel engines were installed and the generating equipment was upgraded. Uh, the ever-increasing demands for electricity led to an addition of new and more powerful engines and generators about every five years. Uh, the 1970s brought major changes to the electric utility. A new dual fuel engine with uh, twice the capacity of any previous engines was added, and the increasing costs of fuel led to the city buying power from large power plants and generating only during peak usage, thus reducing the price paid for power. Uh, in 1979, voters rejected a proposal to sell the rural lines and to lease the electric plant to a large power company. Again, uh, they pretty much liked the idea of staying independent. Uh, in the 1980s, the city began putting power lines underground, and this reduced the chances of power loss uh, due to storm damage. Uh, State Center, because it does have control of its power, it does have a pretty good tradition of never losing power for more than a few hours at the most, and a lot of times it's more of a matter of minutes. 
1992, the city began uh, planning a major upgrade to its electrical light uh, facility, and the need for this upgrade had first been identified in 1973. Again, I put that inside of an example. It took 20 years for the city to get around doing the upgrades that they identified. Uh, so government has long had a tradition of moving maybe a little bit slowly. But then again, when they're spending your tax money, maybe you're probably grateful for that, at least at times. Uh, this project was completed in 1995. Upgrades and improvements have continued to be made if we're large, uh, on a large uh, basis. To, uh, phew, I'm going blow on that one. Uh, upgrades and improvements have continued to be made on a regular basis to maintain a first-class generating and distribution system new power lines transformers and controls were installed in uh, 2014. Uh, next one's kind of interesting it's the city sewer system uh, at the same time the city was expanding electrical service to 24 7. Uh, the city council decided to build a sewer collection and treatment system uh, before this, the city had built some individual sewer lines, uh, but there was no treatment system, which meant they simply ran to the creek. So uh, you can probably guess why some people thought a treatment system might uh, be needed and desirable. Uh, <laughs> In March of 1915, the council passed a resolution uh, to proceed with the construction of a sewer system uh, despite a petition and letters of opposing it. Uh, that we'd gotten along without it before, we didn't need it. Yeah, it just as an, un and I think the cost of a hookup was $45. But of course, this, you know, this, this is 1915, so it's a little more money then. Uh, the cost was about 20,000 total and 24,213 feet of sewer lines were installed. The system was completed in April of 1916. The council uh, cited the progress being made in other communities and the expectation of current and future residents as reasons for the project. And I think they proved to be right on that one. So. In 1943, the State Board of Health condemned the sewer plant as inadequate, outdated, and out of commission. Uh, World War II delayed its replacement until 1948. Uh, at least they had a pretty good reason, I guess, to be a little slow at that point. When the city extended the, uh, extended the sewer system and uh, constructed a new sewer treatment plant. Uh, in 1993, a new lagoon system was placed at plant uh, and meeting uh, the de desire to meet water quality standard remains a goal and a challenge for the city of State Center like everyone else. And you know, we'll, you can, everybody continually debates whether all these rules and regulations are necessary or not. Uh, but obviously, if you had raw, raw sewage running in the stream going above your house, you probably would pretty much appreciate that, that decision that that was necessary. Uh, elect, uh, pardon me, elect, uh, electric communications linking state center to the rest of the world for, uh, from linking the rest of the world. Uh, I'm going to try this one more time. Let's see if I can get it right. Uh, electronic communications linked state center to the rest of the world from the city's beginning. Uh, with the railroad came the telegraph. What was happening in the rest of the world and the country uh, was known in state center in a matter of hours. So in one sense, a lot of rural Iowa, in terms of at least the cities, if you had a rail line, uh, you had the telegraph, and you basically were a few hours away from knowing what's going on in the country and in the world at that point in time. Western Union, the telegraph, and the U.S. Postal Service were the main means of communication over vast distances until the advent of the telephone. The first telephone in State Center came in the 1880s, uh, connecting residents and downtown stores. Individual store owners and so on put in their own phone lines as such, and it was pretty much like that until a small exchange was established in 19, pardon me, 1897, uh, with only a few subscribers. In 1900, uh, states, uh, the, the State Center Telephone Company was formed, and it was expanded. In 1912, this, farmers representing 18 rural lines demanded continuous 24-hour service. 
Uh, uh, they threatened to start their own exchange if it became necessary. As a result, continual phone service began in March of 1912. And of course, the phone company is privately owned at this time, so this is not a city service. Uh, this exchange was sold to the Central Iowa Telephone Company in 1928. Uh, automated dial service replaced human operators in 1959, and it looks like a number of us can remember when that happened, uh, at least when there was operators. Uh, eliminating, eliminating nine of the 11 telephone operators in State Center. So, uh, technology's been eliminating jobs for quite a while. Uh, in 1967, uh, the Central Iowa Telephone Company consolidated with uh, General Telephone Company of Iowa, a subsidiary of GTE, uh, putting state center subscribers under the management of a Nevada office. And so we lost our local telephone office at that point in 67. In 2000, GTE sold the telephone exchange uh, in State Center to Iowa Telecom. In uh, 2006, Iowa Telecom sold the State Center exchange to Partners Communications Cooperative of Gilman. And they actually did set up an office in State Center in 2008. So, um, you know, that consolidation, Ma Bell, you know, and so on, and going back and forth is, is, is sort of a continuous thing going on. And most of us have cell phones, and where it's going from here is we're just kind of wait and see, I think. Um, how are we doing for time? Okay. Uh, early settlers um, or early community leaders. Uh, first one I'll come up is J.W. Dobbin. I mentioned him earlier. He came in uh, 1865. As State Center grew, the need to, uh, for financial services led J.W. Dobbin to establish the first bank, the Exchange Bank of State Center, in 1869. The financial strength of the bank was shown when it survived the nationwide financial panic in 1873 which was, uh, has been credited as being caused by the Chicago fire. Uh, the insurance companies did not keep enough reserves and it's believed that, that all the expenses of the Chicago fire led to, like I say, a, a general panic that took place at that time. Well, the state center bank survived. The bank's name was changed to First National Bank in 1907. After the death of J.W. Dobbin in 1912, his son Fred Dobbin became president of the bank, serving until his retirement, selling the bank to W.L. Bill Hazemeyer and AMC in 1936. In 1942, Bill Hazemeyer bought the Central State Bank from Fred Gilbert, that's the competition, uh, if you will. Uh, Bill Hayesbeyer bought out his partners in First National Bank and merged the two banks. Uh, he retained the name Central State Bank, uh, he's quite diplomatic here, but moved the operation to the First National Bank building on the north side of Main Street. Uh, the Hayesbeyer family continues to own and operate the bank uh, currently. Uh, and they are, they have, uh, there's two major, three, actually three additions are in the process of making the third major addition to that bank from, to, from the original one uh, currently right now. And uh, as far as small town banks go, I, I think their employee numbers are over 20 at this point and increasing. Uh, the, I know the last addition they're putting on has uh, space for uh, another nine people in the bank uh, to work there. So. Um, Next early leader, one of the uh, most interesting and successful of State Center's early businessmen was S.M. Sam Brimhall. Uh, when Sam was born in 1838, railroads were just beginning to be built. Uh, I left out some of this, but it's kind of interesting because Sam Brimhall retired in 1907. Automobiles were kind of a novelty. And there's an article in the 1934 Automobilers magazine, Sam Brimall has just bought a new Plymouth in 1934. He's 96 years old. <laughs> he traded in his 1929 Plymouth. 
that had 80,000 miles on it. He said he enjoyed driving and he liked the independence that the, auto, that the automobiles provided. But you know, you think in terms of a person at his birth, railroads were brand new, you know, in, in 1838. Uh, when he retires, automobiles really have not become at all standard or a kind of a novelty to for people. And now he's driving all over the place. So uh, you talk about people that are able to adjust and deal with change. Uh, he would definitely have been one. He was. He is, uh, he, let's see, I'll, I don't want to jump ahead too much here on it, but see, I'll, I'll tell you about him because, it, uh, anyway, he's a Civil War veteran and he, has, he was an infantryman, he was in the band, and he is a surgeon's assistant in the Civil War. And he is wounded three times. So, uh, like I say, he quite a interesting, interesting person in a lot of ways. Uh, Sam Brimble arrived in State Center between 1865 and 1867. Uh, in one article, he says it's 1865. Most of his uh, the obituaries and songs says says he came in 18. Uh, it, it, pardon me, he said 1865 in that interview, but this is the 1934 interview and he's 96 years old. Uh, so uh, most, his uh, obituaries and most of the accounts of his life say he came in 1867. Uh, he trained as a doctor and there's a good chance it might have been uh, under O.G. Hunt who also ran a drugstore as long with his uh, medical practice. But he never practiced medicine in any great extent. Uh, he had served as a surgeon's assistant during the Civil War. Uh, Sam began operating a drugstore in 1869. And I kind of, like I say, I sort of think he may have taken over for O.G. Hunt then uh, in that capacity, though I have not found the exact evidence of that. It's, it's kind of fairly likely. Uh, his success as a druggist took uh, most of his time. In 1878, he uh, opened a new drugstore and bookstore in partnership with his brother, C.W. Brimhall. Uh, in 1885, the Brimhall brothers acquired the local furniture business from Henshaw and Gulick. Uh, and they operated a, the furniture store and an undertaking business. I haven't found evidence that at that point they started doing undertaking, but I know in later years Brimhall West was a, did undertaking. So I am guessing they did that, and I'm guessing with his, uh, if he had medical training, that would be a pretty easy uh, adjustment for him to be to participate in and to do. Uh, by 18. 90, Sam Brimall was the sole owner of, owner of S.M. Brimall and Company, and his brother C.W. Brimall uh, had become a druggist in Shaler, Iowa. Uh, Sam's nephews, C. Howard and Walter F. Brimhall, both druggists, took over the operation of the business when Sam retired in 1907. Uh, Walter had joined the firm in 1890, uh, Howard in 1899. Uh, the brothers purchased the business from Sam in 1912, and it was, uh, once again, Brimhall Brothers. So that, when you're doing research, you're showing, wait a minute, it's Brimhall Brothers here, and it's Brimhall Brothers there. Well, it's two different sets of brothers. Uh, one Sam and his brother, and the other is his two nephews. Uh, I believe he came from a family of about nine or ten children. Uh, so, like I say, the, uh, like a lot of the businesses, you see a lot of movement of uh, brothers who are maybe a gener almost a generation later in life and so on, or uh, nephews that you know will come in and participate uh, in in the businesses. Uh, in 1932, Cliff West uh, joined Brimhall Brothers. Cliff was married to Walter's niece Marion, who had been raised by Walter and his wife. In 1935, Cliff West purchased Walter's interest in the furniture store and funeral home business and the business name became Brimhall West, which uh, some of you may remember them in operation in State Center. Uh, Walter retained his interest in the drugstore. Howard remained a partner in the furniture and furniture business as well as operating the drugstore until his sudden death in 1943. And from what I can tell at that point, State Center until recently did not have a druggist other than uh, operations within the doctor's offices. 
from that from that point because that the drugstore business was sold to Brush Van Pelt, a longtime employee, but Brush was not a druggist and did not employ a druggist. So the, the, he ran a drugstore, but there was no pharmacy in conjunction with it. Uh, Cliff West continued to own and operate the Brimhall West furniture business and funeral home until his death in 1987. Uh, for part of this time, his son Jim West uh, worked with him. Uh, Jim was a state representative for a number of years and so on. But, uh, okay, keep checking here on time. Uh, I'll go through a couple of more names here and then I'll kind of throw it open to questions if there's areas you want me to cover because I have a feeling I could cover more than I have time for. Uh, uh, W.E. Watson. Another longtime businessman was W.E. Watson who came to State Center in 1869. Billy Watson was 16 years old and most likely went to work for S.W. Morgan. Uh, who ran a grocery and general merchandise store. By 1881, the two were partners in the business. And in 1885, uh, Billy became sole proprietor of the business, which uh, Mr. Morgan, uh, when Mr. Morgan moved to Marshalltown. And S.W. Morgan continued to be a businessman in Marshalltown from that time. And uh, I know there's contact because the papers talk about social events where he comes back to State Center and is visiting uh, with uh, Billy Watson or with Watson and so on. So we know there's contact between them that continued afterwards. Uh, the business uh, became Watson's Grocery Store. A uh, new brick building was constructed in 1895 to house Watson's grocery store after a fire destroyed the old wooden building that it had occupied. In fact, that half block in State Center, all but one building, burned in 1895. Actually, there were two fires, one earlier and one later, uh, that took place. But in the end, there's only one building left. And so uh, the rest of the buildings were 1895 and later then. Uh, the, move, the new building was a sister building to uh, another new building, which housed Tummel's clothing store next door. Uh, some of you would remember this as Benson's or Gladys's, if you're from State Center uh, store, in the same locations. Um, Pauline Tummel Watson, uh, Billy's wife, was uh, a sister to uh, J.W. Uh, Tummel, who operated the clothing store. Uh, so uh, probably not surprisingly, they ended up kind of working in conjunction with the, with the new construction of the buildings. Um, Bill Watson retired from the business in 1920. Watson's Grocery continued to operate under his sons, Ralph and Bill, and then later under Ralph and his wife, Florence. Uh, the store remained in business until shortly after Ralph's death in 1981. A little over a year later, Florence simply locked the doors one day and did not return. Uh, the grocery products, many of them, not all of them, I, they didn't leave the meats and so on, but all the canned goods, sat on the shelves until the building was sold following Florence's death in 1989. Uh, the store had been maintained in its original state or for the most part anyway, uh, with much of its oak shelves and fixtures dating back to, uh, for over a century, to the original construction of the store in 1895. Uh, for this reason, there was a community-wide effort to purchase the building with as much of its contents as possible. Uh, this happened at an auction held by the uh, Florence's heirs. Uh, the community's uh, successful efforts led to the creation of the historic Watson Grocery Store Museum in 1989, and it still operates in State Center. Uh, so, uh, now that in looking at some research, I came up with a few things that kind of boggle your mind. If you've been into Watson's, it's you know a typical small town grocery store. But in, when it opened in 1895, they said that the first two front rooms of the building were a dentist's office. And there's a side door that kind of goes to the side. They said you went in the side door and around behind those offices to get into the main part of the grocery store. 
So, you know, in terms of uh, businesses trying to maximize space and so on. But the front of the building then was uh, Dr. Frank Ball, I believe was the name of the uh, dentist that operated there. I doubt he was there for very long. I'm guessing he moved on and the store, you know, ended up taking the front portion and using it as, uh, it, you can't see any evidence in the building of that happening. But the articles are re uh, from the, the, uh, the opening of the store in the Enterprise. So I have no reason to doubt that that's pretty much the truth, uh, the truth in it. So uh, Next, uh, W. N. Gilbert. William Northrop Gilbert came to State Center in 1878. He, along with his brother, H. M. Gilbert, opened a dry goods store and named it Gilbert Brothers. The store was operated by this partnership until the retirement of H. M. Gilbert in 1898, pardon me, 1896. William Gilbert continued running the dry goods store until 1901, uh, when he took a leadership role in establishing and operating a new bank called the Bank of State Center, uh, which later changed its name to Central State Bank. Uh, William sold his interest of the store to his niece, Amy Gilbert, and to Elmer Benson, uh, a 15-year employee of the store. It was renamed Benson and Gilbert until uh, Elmer Benson became the sole owner of the business five years later. Uh, William Gilbert served as president of the Central State Bank until his death in 1921. He was a prominent leader in the community and served two terms in the Iowa legislature. His son, F.B. Fred Gilbert, an attorney in Marshalltown, he actually in 1914 traveled daily on the railroad back and forth uh, to Marshalltown to uh, his offices here. Uh, uh, succeeded him as president of the bank, holding the position until he sold the bank to uh, Bill Hazemeyer in 1942. Uh, Fred commanded a uh, U.S. Army uh, course, Air Corps squadron during World War I. Uh, actually ended up, I believe, stationed in Scotland, though, so I, he didn't probably see too much action at that point. But uh, Like his father before him, Fred played an active role in state politics, serving two terms in the Iowa legislature, serving as chair of the Iowa, Iowa Republican Party, uh, from 1941 to 1943, and serving as chair of the Iowa Highway Commission from 1945 to 1951. So, uh, William's former employee, Elmer Benson, owned and operated the dry goods business until his retirement in 1957. Elmer was a fixture on state centers business in state centers business communities for 71 years. I believe he served about 24 years on the city council. So he beats me by a long ways on that one. Uh, beginning when he operated a small bakery after first coming to the state center in 1885. Amazingly, uh, there was a second longtime business uh, activity or businessman active in state center's Main Street uh, during this time, uh, Robert Holsworth. Robert operated a jewelry business for 69 years in State Center from about 1870 until his death in 1939. This is one of those businessmen that, you know, they kind of died with their boots on uh, in many cases. Uh, let me wrap up a couple and then I'll try and keep going here. My problem is I can, yeah. Uh, another prominent State Center businessman was John Gudekunst. Uh, John arrived in the area in 1864 and began purchasing farmland. At the time of his death in 1910, he was identified as possibly the wealthiest man in Marshall County. Uh, John left the bulk of his estate to his only son, J. Gifford Gudekunst. Gifford was a local attorney and, like his father, a former mayor of State Center. Uh, he was a uh, lieutenant in the Army Air Corps during World War I having no direct descendants when he died in 1971, Gifford left the farmland he had inherited to the city of State Center for the purpose of supporting the public library. Uh, his uh, former home now is the home of the Goodikens Public Library, and if you've been through State Center, you know that they are making an addition and doubling the size of the library. 
and they have done a wonderful job of making an addition that matches beautifully with the original house and so on. So, uh, and like I say, I include John Gudicus because he's the one that kind of acquired the wealth that became the source of that. And also, uh, Gifford Gudicus was mayor of State Center when the library became public, uh, public supported library. So, uh, and he would have named the first library board. So he, did, he had a, a tie to that, and of course his wife was a retired teacher as well. So anyway, uh, State Center has been very fortunate in that form. Uh, another individual I'll identify is Dr. Ira D. Kaufman. Dr. Kaufman was, uh, had a lasting impact on State Center. He began practicing medicine in State Center in 1901. At first he practiced with Dr. Center, a Civil War veteran. Uh, Dr. Center practiced in State Center until 1908, and then he came to Marshalltown and continued to practice in Marshalltown uh, until he, his, shortly before his uh, passing in 1919. Um, one interesting thing about, he was not a surgeon, he was a homeopathic doctor, which basically in the, the you know, in an age before a lot of our modern drugs, people are trying to figure out what you do with chronic conditions like indigestion, heartburn, and arthritis. Well, he was basically into trying to figure out what kind of treatments would help you in that area. So, you know, even then there are some divisions or specialization of doctors. Uh, Dr. Kaufman retired in 1932, moving to California in 1935. Uh, Dr. Kaufman is, fredi is credited with having the first automobile in State Center. He served as president of the local automobile club, uh, working to bring the uh, with the automobile club, working to bring the historic Lincoln Highway down State Center's Main Street. When he died in 1953, he left several farms to the city of State Center. Uh, the city gained possession of the farms in uh, 1991. They were in trust to support his wife first and then his daughter. So uh, when his daughter died in 1991, uh, uh, then the farms passed to the city. After the death of Dr. Kaufman's daughter, the proceeds from the sale of the land were used to establish the Ira D. Kaufman Charitable Trust, uh, which distributes fifty to $70,000 annually to projects in the state center community. So uh, the city park is named after Dr. Kaufman, rather appropriately. Uh, the uh, shelter house there is named after Dr. Kaufman. And of course, it, um, much of the uh, Rose Garden facilities and the, the park facilities and so on are in large part funded by uh, his uh, trust. Okay, uh, development and changes in transportation. Uh, State Center, like many towns in Iowa and the nation, was created by the railroad. Uh, early, settlement, early settlements uh, worked to bring the railroad to their communities, and they were forced to move their communities to the railroad lines. Incorpor or incorporation of the towns usually coincided with the arrival of the railroad. Arrival of the railroad. Get that right. For example, roads then known as Edenville, was settled before State Center, but was not incorporated until the railroad arrived in 1880. The value of the rail connection to local business was evident when C.B. Rhodes, a prominent State Center area businessman, as well as Rhodes businessman, uh, donated funds to build the depot in Edenville. Uh, at first, only the depot was named for him. The railroad appreciated the fact he made the donation. So you had uh, the Rhodes Depot in Needenville. Uh, eventually, you know, the town switched to, as well. Uh, the closer the land was to the rail line, the more valuable the land. Uh, local businessmen supplied the farmers and, brought their, and bought their products. Uh, more settlers and immigrants meant more farms and products. This meant more business for the towns and for the railroad. So economic development and working at economic development has been a long tradition in Iowa. Uh, and if it, uh, go back to my history teacher role, uh, the Civil War in part was the, the Kansas-Nebraska Act was done so they could get a railroad built. 
And to get a railroad built, they needed to create it as a state, Kansas and Nebraska as a state. Well, in doing that, they had to deal with, you might say, the issue of slavery. And so, uh, and of course, when the Republicans had control in 1862, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, Railroad Act in 1862 was passed. So uh, the, that economic development then was a key part for the state and of course it would be a key part for Marshall County and uh, for State Center. Uh, in 1881, State Center acquired a second rail line, the Grinnell and Montezuma Railroad built a branch line connecting State Center to the uh, Central Iowa Railroad main line in Grinnell. Uh, it became part of the Central Iowa Railroad in 1882 and its name was later changed to the Iowa Central Railroad. This was at first uh, leased and operated by the Minneapolis and St. Paul Railroad, which purchased the line in 1912. Uh, the north end of this branch line ended in State Center. Uh, using the Y Junction Yard uh, to turn its engines around. The, the depot is located basically, if you know State Center, it's where the ball field is. Schilling Field uh, used to be the football and baseball field. Uh, now it is just the baseball field. But that was a Y intersection for the, uh, what was the Iowa Central, later than the Emmons St. L Railroad. Uh, uh, the uh, Emmons St. L Depot and rail line through State Center was abandoned in 1925. Interestingly enough, um, Ray Richards was the agent for the Emmons St. L Railroad in State Center when it closed. And he would later then become the depot agent in Zeering. And uh, that becomes important because the depot that State Center has moved into town is from Zeering and was a former Iowa Central M and St. L Railroad depot, similar to the one that used to sit down at Schilling Field in State Center. So that's one of the reasons it's kind of attractive to it. And actually, that building, it did have the State Center depot agent in it uh, later on. Though not well, not at that time when it was in State Center. Uh, in that, by 1900, a rail line was located in every town of 100 or more people in, in Iowa. And no farm was more than five miles from a train station. About a 50-minute automobile ride. By the early 1900s, prominent retired merchants such as Sam Brimall were traveling to California or Florida for the winter months. Uh, one local attorney, I think I mentioned it before, Fred Gilbert, actually commuted daily to Marshalltown on the rail lines at that time. But a new form of transportation was about to revolutionize life in America and around, uh, and around the world. The internal combustion engine and the automobile and trucks it powered transformed life in America, especially in small towns and rural areas. This reduced isolation and increased individual freedom and independence. Uh, it resulted in an explosion in demand for automobiles and in the need for products and services to support them. Um, I'll just go to the uh, automobile dealers. It, in, uh, like I said, uh, the first person to have a car in state centers identified as Dr. Kaufman. Uh, in the history book, and the, uh, you can find a picture of him and his, uh, what it looks like is about a 1901 or 1902 Holzman, made in Chicago from 1901 to 1910. It looks like a carriage with a motor under the seat and a tiller wheel on it, and it has a carriage type hood. And the, the headlights are basically lanterns that hang in the corner. So very much an early, he had, is credited with having the first car in town. This is his 1901. Uh, by 1908, State Center has three automobile dealers. And the local, one of the local liveries, uh, liveries bought a 1908 Buick to rent to people. So, you know, that they, they were adapting really pretty fast to the change. But if you think how rapidly things are changing at this point, uh, I'll probably at this, let me sum up a little bit on the transportation and then uh, I'll kind of open it up if you have some questions for areas. And I've got some other areas I can cover, if you will, but uh, I'll see, see where we're at. I think we're running a little bit towards the end. 
Uh, in terms of the automobile boom, in 1905, there was a total of 799 cars in Iowa. That's one for every 2,766 people, which means <laughs> State Center would have had a little less than a half a car, <laughs> if you're proportionately. In 1910, there are 10,400 and 20 cars in Iowa registered. That's one for every 215 people. For State Center, we got about five cars now in town. In 1915, there's 147,000 cars in Iowa, one for every 16 people. Uh, in State Center, that would be 60 cars. In 1920, 437,000 plus cars, one for every five and a half people. And when you think of the families in 1920, that's about one per family. Uh, for State Center, that's 180 cars. Uh, car dealerships are being formed, gas stations are being formed, all this is new. Uh, State Center has you know, struggled to bring the Lincoln Highway down Main Street and has succeeded. Uh, well, officially, it was always down Main Street. Uh, the local, or the Marshall County, A.A. Uh, a. Moore was the uh, council for the Lincoln Highway in Marshalltown. And he didn't like the route down State Center's Main Street. So from basically 1913, when it, it was officially declared the route down Main Street, the temporary route was north of town. What happened is the railroad, along, if you follow the gravel road that goes along the uh, Union Pacific Rail Line from about Lamoille to State Center, uh, if you like gra driving gravel, or, you, know, you can do that. It runs right along the rail line, and that had been graveled. And there also was a wooden overpass o over the railroad uh, just north of State Center, just a little bit north and east of State Center. And he thought it was a lot more practical to have the overpass instead of having to cross the railroad tracks and to have a gravel. The, the road running straight into State Center was basically still a mud road. Uh, so uh, State Center would work very hard to get the streets graveled. The county would move to get the curves taken out and to improve that route running into State Center. State Center is using all of its political strength, you know, to keep that going. And in 1922, they succeeded in getting the Lincoln Highway to go down Main Street. Uh, the Highway Commission wasn't real happy with that because they, they couldn't get the railroad to build an underpass, or, you know, to, to replace it. So they, the road ended up, it uh, had to turn and go across railroad tracks and go north. That would be, uh, let's be, no state center. There used to be a lumber yard there in the mill, the mill setting there, and it's the corner at the high school. So as some of you I see from state center know what it is. You, you would turn north there, you'd go north to a T, and then you'd turn, goes by the high school, the middle school, and Kaufman Park, which was originally a tourist park on the Lincoln Highway. Uh, as the city actually established the park for the tourists as part of uh, its effort, you know, to keep them happy and keep them coming. Uh, so in, in 22, they got it going down Main Street, and of course then in 25, they paved it across the county. And that went right down State Center's Main Street and around, and uh, again, it had to go north because the railroad did not, the railroad was supposed to have built it in 21 and build an, an underpass or an overpass. Uh, they would not finish getting an underpass built till about 1930. And that's when uh, what many people think of as the Lincoln Highway, the 4th Street and 9th Avenue route goes by the Rose Garden. Uh, and that took place uh, in 30 and 31. The state paved that. They agreed, they also, uh, completed the bypass around Schilling Field then that went down to, from Main Street. So you could go down Main Street, that would be paved, and you could then cut back to the overpass that way. Uh, that was supposed to be the original route, but the railroad never got it done. So by the time the state built that, they also built the bigger bypass uh, that went by it. And of course, 
serving stations and filling stations moved off of Main Street and they moved down to Forest Street. Uh, and uh, Home Oil and West Falls Standard were the first two, actually West Falls Standard was the first station uh, built on that route in 1931. Uh, 1933, uh, Home Oil got built on that route. Uh, and I'll kind of conclude unless you have questions with the fact that by uh, early 1993, uh, I think West Falls Standard was the last full service station in State Center and it closed uh, as a gas station. Uh, regulations for tanks played a big part of it. If you didn't have fairly large volume, uh, Home Oil had closed as a gas station in 1990. Uh, you know, so there's, there's a whole boom, and I can go into detail on it, but I think we're kind of running short of time here. Uh, there were three automobile, you know, long-term automobile dealers, a Chrysler Plymouth dealer, a Chevy dealer, and a Ford dealer. The Chevy and Ford went for a fairly long time. The Chevy is the last to close in also about 1993. Uh, there were implement dealers uh, to serve the farms that developed, you know, Wells uh, implement dealer on Main Street. Uh, you had the Keeley uh, International dealership on Main Street. Uh, there was a Farron Case dealership. Uh, all of these closed about 1970 as big, you know, the same thing that led them to expand beyond being hard parts of hardware stores led them to cease existing, if you will, because well, as you know, if you drive to Ames, you know the size of the dealerships. Fan Wall, uh, you know, uh, Marshalltown, uh, you know, the Southern, they may, they may still have some tractors at Southern, they think, but that's part of Van Wall, I believe, now. So it's kind of a consolidation. A lot of my uh, research in this history is made possible by the fact that the Goodrich Library has placed the uh, State Center Enterprise uh, online, and you can access the archives. Uh, and they have kind of a spattering of papers before 1901, but they basically have all the papers from 1901 up to the present. So, you, you know, that's kind of allowed me to do a lot of research on some of this material, if you will. So, um, and it was, uh, a, a man named Lacey founded it, but uh, I think it was J.W. Merrill was the uh, first editor, and he actually was the editor for Lacey and later bought him out. And he would operate the paper uh, for 34 years, I believe until like 1903. Then his son, Bert Merrill, ran up for 13 years. And then a professor at Iowa State bought the paper, and he brought in a man named Sunderland, uh, who ran the paper uh, for about 29 years. Uh, in fact, I, I interviewed and talked to his daughter, who lives, I think she might still be alive in Ames. She's in her mid 90s. Uh, and then a, a number of other people uh, have operated the paper afterwards. And I, I could, uh, like I say, if you want to know the details, I do have the list of who they are in the, in the, in the history. The school. Uh, it was, the first uh, grade school was established in 1865. Uh, probably the, the, the high school, the first high school class in State Center was in 1884. 1881, they built a three-story building and they basically were divided into departments. First graduating class was 1884. That's about 20 years ahead of most small towns and most consolidated school districts in Iowa. So they, the State Center was a fairly large community by the standards of the time, if you will, for a small town. It is still a small rural town that serviced the, you know, an agriculture area and so on. But it had, uh, you know, like I say, a, a, a high school long before a lot of other places did as well. And again, I have some details on that in the book if you want to know more. The 1881 building was not burned down, it was torn down. It was torn down in 1947 to make way for the new elementary building. Uh, and basically it had been condemned uh, as being, you know, the, if, you, if you went in a lot of these old buildings, the key thing was if they had wooden staircases and especially open wooden staircases, uh, they no longer would come close to meeting modern fire codes. Uh, 
Uh, State Center is able to remodel and preserve their 1923 high school building because it has enclosed concrete stairwells. Uh, and uh, it, it took a couple go-rounds with engineers to get them to admit that we could, the building was solid enough to be restored. The first one thought it, you know, it, he didn't want to deal with restoring buildings or, you know, fixing them up. The second engineer they had uh, said that it wasn't a problem and they had no problem doing it. First guy said we could put a million dollars in it, we'll guarantee it for 15 years. Well, 15 years later, the building still sound, solid, standing as solid as ever. And, uh, you know, you get somebody that has done, you know, that, that type of work, yeah, it's no problem. A lot of engineers and construction companies don't want to deal with uh, historic preservation, if you will, at times. State Center is a Main Street community. And uh, in part, kind of piggybacking on the Watson's grocery store, uh, State Center, uh, the, uh, when they got involved with Main Street uh, as, as an organization, they started looking at the buildings. And at that time, there was a lot of push that you don't want to try and make your buildings look like something they aren't. You basically want them to kind of be what they are and uh, update them. So basically, the State Center Development Association, uh, under the with under the leadership of the Main Street program of Iowa, has restored probably seven, eight buildings, and some some have been done by private individuals, as well. Uh, but uh, they've plugged into and gotten grants and so on for the restoration of those buildings. And uh, if if you look at a modern strip mall, uh, an open one, that's what a Main Street is for the most part. Uh, and some of the main streets are out surviving the strip malls uh, as far as Houston goes. The, the, the tricky part, if you go through Watson's grocery store, it's about 1,800, 2,000 square feet, which is fine for a grocery store at that time. When the State Center Development Association looked into bringing a, a grocery store into town, somebody that would operate, they said, we've got to have at least six, about 6,000 square feet. We can't make a, a business go with less than that much space. So they ended up building, a, a, you know, getting grants and so on and building a new building uh, for them on Main Street. And one of the great things is everybody is, we aren't going to have enough parking. There won't be any parking. We won't have a parking lot. Well, what is a Main Street <laughs> but a parking lot? And actually, when the, the, the one problem that has not occurred at all for the grocery store is parking, as far as I know. I, I don't think I've had anybody... You, you get a lot closer to State Center's grocery store <laughs> from anywhere on Main Street, just about, than if you go to Walmart or Hy-Vee. I mean, uh, and of course, the size of the stores, you, you go a block and a half just about to get to the back of the store. So, but uh, yeah, that, we've done a lot of re restoring of buildings and so on, and I think we've captured some of the quality of, the, of it. And, Again, it's a, just a, a constant struggle to find businesses that kind of fit, you know, what it, what it takes to, to make a go on it, of it. But I, so far, I think we've been fairly successful at it. Uh, the old telephone, you know, what, it, the old telephone building is quite a challenge. They're putting the second story back on it. And the t telephone company bought the building, uh, which had been built as a restaurant and hotel. If you can imagine about a... 1,000 or square foot hotel, which is the upstairs of that building. Uh, obviously, expectations of travelers was not as great at that time. <laughs> but there, uh, and uh, the, the Evans Cafe building is what we call it. In 1905, uh, the Evans family bought it, started operating it as a bakery and restaurant, and I believe the mother who was, uh, had lost her husband in about 1900, 1901, I think moved in upstairs. And so it ceased to be a hotel at that point. Uh, but from what I can tell, up until about that point, it was at, that they advertised uh, a hotel and restaurant across from the bank. And the bank would be the old original building of the uh, uh, Central State Bank building, which would be exactly where that building was located. I have history books <laughs> for sale, and, and I will give you one.
Oh, thank so. you very much. So. Because there's fun here doesn't mean you don't need your own. Yeah. <laughs>